to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast, where we explore the gospel that Jesus' earliest disciples heard and what the last several decades of historical studies have clarified about this first century Jewish message. Welcome to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. I'm Josh Hawkins, and I'm here today with Bill Schofield and John Harrigan. Hey guys, how are you? What's going on? Doing well. Awesome. Yeah, I'm trying to survive uh, getting through 2020 like everybody else over here. <laughs> Bill's chilling out in his refrigerator where he records. Yeah, Bill. Bill's clenching his fists and biting his nails and shivering and his jaw is moving. What is it, like 20 below there? <laughs> <laughs> I am in Northern California, so let's not lose our heads, but it's cold. I'm, <laughs> I'm in a cold room that doesn't have any heat and... No, it's in the 40s outside, but oh, I'll survive. There are worse problems in the world at the moment. That there is. It's balmy. Balmy in Cairo. It's nice. Yeah. Oh, man. Maybe we should head there. Well, Allahu Akbar in the Minus background. the Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Kuliyom, tuliyom. Yeah. All day, every day. <laughs> oh, man. Well, it's great to be with you guys today. We want to continue our series on how a first century Jew would have understood the phrase, the kingdom of God. And... We began a couple of weeks ago by introducing the topic as something connected with Jewish apocalyptic themes seen throughout the Old Testament and Second Temple literature, like the Day of Judgment, the Day of the Lord, the Resurrection of the Dead, etc. And last week, we looked at the theological history of the kingdom, really how it went from being understood as an apocalyptic eschatological reality in the first century to an immaterial heavenly idea through Origen and the Alexandrian school to Eusebius and the Constantinian shift where the kingdom of heaven was really this eternal reality that the church participates in now as they exercise dominion over pagan cultures and foreign gods, etc. And then still further, we looked into Augustine in the fourth century where he brought together these two approaches um, of the kingdom, especially in his work called the city of God. And we then fast forwarded through history to the 19th and 20th centuries, where we discussed the works of Johannes Weiss and Albert Schweitzer, um, two scholars who began to seriously grapple with first century Jewish apocalypticism, um, again, after the two major horns of Augustinianism had dominated um, theological discourse for most of church history up to that point. And after Schweitzer and Weiss, we began to name drop some other continental scholars and theologians and historians who really wrestled or grappled in some sense with the Jew Jewish apocalyptic framework of the scriptures and specifically the subject of the kingdom of God. So names like Bart Ehrman, Paula Fredrickson, who were historical scholars, and then C.H. Dodd or Oscar Kuhlman and George Eldon Ladd, scholars who saw the kingdom as having been realized or inaugurated to one degree or another, Dodd being the one who basically basically just wrote off so many apocalyptic passages. And we also talked about Rudolf Bultmann, one of the clearest grapplers with Jewish apocalyptic, and he demythologized uh, all of it and removed the historical and the cosmological details and just replaced them for ethic or moral or uh, theological teachings. And as we said, Bultmann was and still is much more influential than many think. We also mentioned other important names like Ernst Kazeman and J.C. Becker, um, ones who really began to take Jewish apocalyptic a little bit more seriously. Again, it was Kazeman who said that apocalyptic was the mother of all Christian theology. And we briefly spoke about Doug Campbell and, of course, N.T. Wright, a name many might be familiar with because he's massively influential today. And while he um, to a, a slight degree, affirms Jewish apocalyptic, he's not an apocalypticist. He basically says, well, yeah, first century Jews were apocalyptic, but Jesus came to redefine and reimagine it all. And Paul was the Jew who saw through the fog of apocalypticism and realized that the life and death and resurrection of Jesus had just kind of reimagined that old carnal Jewish hope. And, you know, Jesus sat on the throne of David and launched the age to come right in the middle of as Wright would say, ongoing and contested history. Um, we kind of concluded our cursory view of how scholars have wrestled with Jewish apocalyptic by discussing a bit about dispensationalism um, and really how we saw that as a system that sought to take apocalyptic um, a little bit more seriously again, but it was flawed in the sense that it proposed two plans of salvation, a heavenly plan for the church and an earthly plan for the Jews. So definitely go back and listen to last week's episode if you haven't heard it, as it's going to make a lot more sense of what we'll discuss in this episode and in the next several. Um, wow. That was quite the recap, Josh. 
That was pretty incredible. <laughs> You can almost Thanks, skip Scott. last episode. Don't do it. But you almost uh, could. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. Now, last week, we ended the discussion by proposing that first century Jewish apocalypticism is still the best option when seeking to interpret eschatological passages in the New Testament, specifically ones related to the kingdom of God. Like we looked at Matthew 19 and the 12 throne sayings of Jesus, and we saw that passage was filled with themes like Jewish election, the return of the 12 tribes, salvation, eternal life, judgment, etc. And we made the comment that everything breaks down if you try to explain that passage through the lens of realized eschatology and an inaugurated kingdom of God. And Reformed theology and a lot of modern evangelicals say that it's been realized in this age or that it was spiritually actu- actualized somehow by the events of Acts 2. But to make it work that way, you really have to do what Boltman advocated for, which is just demythologize it all and make it applicable to today. But as we've said about so many other passages in the New Testament, it fits squarely within a Jewish apocalyptic framework. And so that brings us to today's episode, where we want to look at several passages from the Gospels that are often used to say that Jesus introduced realized eschatology or a spiritual kingdom, like language like the kingdom is at hand, or the kingdom of God has come upon you, or the kingdom is within you, really because of all of the history of the last 100 to 150 years that we developed last week, this language is typically understood outside the context of Jewish apocalyptic. But our goal today is to show you that they fit best within a Jewish apocalyptic framework, not outside of it. So let's talk about a few of these passages, guys. I mean, there really isn't any need for redefinition um, when we look at and, and talk about some of these passages, right? Yeah, the the vast majority of kingdom passages in the New Testament, specifically the Gospels, uh, fit comfortably within Jewish apocalyptic worldview. Um, you have some 140 uses of the term kingdom, uh, not all of which are specifically reference the kingdom of God, but the, the vast majority that do reference the kingdom of God simply mean the Jewish messianic kingdom within an apocalyptic framework that the majority of Jews held at the time. And so this is evidenced, um, you know, in, in uh, the disciples' question, are you now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Or at the triumphal, is, uh, triumphal entry when Jesus is coming in, everybody in Mark uh, 11 is uh, rejoicing and saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Uh, and so this is the kind of common expectation. And you have, uh, you know, most, the vast majority of instances where the reference to the kingdom simply fits within common uh, expectation. You have, you know, a few, a handful that are debatable. And usually it's those, that handful that get strung together to say that Jesus and the apostles radically redefined, uh, Jewish apocalyptic expectations concerning the kingdom. Right. There, there are a number, number of passages where, where it basically clarifies the conversation that's being had. And, and, or in, in the middle of these conversations, you see how everybody's already thinking about the kingdom of God. And as we said last week, Unless there's like a clear redefinition of something coming into it, then there's no need to redefine it. So like Luke 14 is one that comes to mind for me when uh, Jesus is teaching in Luke 14, he says, and you'll be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And one of the dinner guests upon hearing this said, blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. So in their mind, the resurrection and the kingdom of God, same thing. And obviously, Jesus doesn't correct the idea. It just go, goes on to the next point. Yeah. And another one I think of is Matthew 8. And, you know, just again, connecting the idea of the kingdom with a future Jewish apocalyptic reality. Jesus uh, says, truly, I tell you, I've not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And, you know, referencing eschatological realities like the great banquet from Isaiah 25 and connecting these realities again with the restoration of the 12 tribes and, you know, the kingdom of heaven. Like you said, Bill, it's synonymous. This is, um, you know, fully 
first century Jewish apocalyptic, and and this is where the majority of the kingdom passages easily fit. But, you know, there are several, several passages, like you said, John, maybe five to ten, that tend to make people think the other way. And, you know, like we've talked about in our episode last week when we developed all of the history, uh, yeah, there's there's scholars that would say, well, clearly Jesus is introducing some sort of realized or uh, or inaugurated eschatology, specifically with these passages related to the kingdom. So what we want to do is we want to take three of the main kind of, I guess, main phrases or, or main ways um, that are used to, to support some sort of realized eschatology, passages that say the kingdom is at hand passages that say the kingdom has come upon you, and passages that, specifically one passage that says that the kingdom is within you or in your midst. And we want to work through these passages today just to show you, again, how we feel that they fit best within a first century Jewish apocalyptic framework. And so let's talk about this first one, guys, from early on in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 3 and Matthew 4, when Jesus would say the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What's the deal with this being at hand? Yeah, so um, uh, Matthew 3, John the Baptist, Matthew 4, when Jesus begins to preach, saying the kingdom of God is at hand. Um, so these are just a reiteration of a really common phrase in the prophets that the day of the Lord is at hand. Yeah. And so the reason that's a little awkward is because most people associate the teachings about the kingdom and even the day of the Lord is at hand with something really positive. And they're really mostly not really positive. It actually, so if you read passages like Isaiah 13 or Joel 1, 15, Zephaniah 1, like 7 and, and, and following in that chapter... You find a description of what it means that the day of the Lord is at hand. And one of the things we mentioned a couple weeks back, a couple episodes back, was that what happens is, is that the, the kingdom kind of, by the first century, becomes a catchphrase for a lot of these dynamics, some positive, some negative. But here's a really good example. The at-hand passages in the New Testament, really clear in Matthew 3 with John the Baptist, but... Um, they are essentially reiterating the intensity of the prophets prophesying and proclaiming the coming day of the Lord, that it was at hand, and it was demanding a reckoning and a response from the people. Right. So, you know, Jesus and John the Baptist in this way are, are saying the same thing, and you, you often have, because of this dynamic, a lot of scholars will try to argue that Jesus and John the Baptist fundamentally were preaching different things. You know, if, if you think that Jesus was realizing or, or reimagining the eschatological hopes of the time, and so John was proclaiming the uh, temporal nearness, but Jesus was proclaiming the metaphysical or spatial realization of it somehow. And, you know, for example, like Ladd's uh, uh, presence of the, the future, you know, he spends two, three entire pages just arguing that John the Baptist and Jesus were preaching different things when the Greek phrase is the exact same thing. The, the context is, uh, arguably the same. It's the same idea that Jesus is, is simply proclaiming the nearness of the day of God and the nearness of the coming messianic kingdom and the assumption that he's the Messiah. And, this gets really evidenced, for example, when he sends out uh, the apostles in Matthew 10, and he says, Proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And if anyone will not receive you, or, you know, heal the sick, cast out demons, blah, blah, blah. If anyone will not receive you, a few verses later, or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. So there you get an example where the kingdom of God is at hand and the event of the day of judgment are associated closely. And I think this is, you know, this just represents that this is what they had in mind when they're proclaiming the kingdom of heaven's at hand, the day of God is at hand, uh, the the resurrection's at hand, the age to come is at hand. Yeah, yeah, John. And I think, 
you know, maybe some would hear the word at hand or other translations might say that it's near um, and assume that we're talking about uh, or, or assume that Jesus rather is talking about spatial nearness as a par- as opposed to temporal nearness. And clearly these passages are emphasizing a, a temporal nearness as opposed to some sort of uh, kind of, you know, spiritual realm or something that's kind of invading or being around Jesus when he's healing and somehow that's bringing a, a spatial kingdom of, of some sort. But um, another passage that I think emphasizes this really well is Luke chapter 21, um, where Jesus would say, now when these things begin to take place, meaning the signs that would lead up to his apocalyptic coming, uh, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. And so when you see these things take place later on, he says, know that the kingdom of God is near. Again, the, the parallelism between the redemption, Jewish apocalyptic understanding of the, the idea of the redemption, the, the, uh, the saving of the nation of Israel, restored back to their land. And when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near, meaning the Davidic messianic kingdom is temporally near, not necessarily spatially near. And and you could throw in 1 Peter 4, 7 in the same way, where Peter would say, the end of all things is at hand. Uh, and, and again, this is Peter just reiterating how he understood Jesus's words in passages like Matthew 10 and Luke 21. Yeah, and this particular point on the kingdom being at hand has been taken by historical and critical scholars and pushed through to the point of unbelief in which, you know, they say that Jesus uh, and John the Baptist, you know, believe that the day of God was going to happen, the kingdom was going to come, but it didn't come. And they crucified him. He died. He was a deluded first century apocalyptic prophet. Um, and I don't think that, you know, is the case at all. It's uh, the apostles at the time wrestled with the so-called delay of the coming, the parousia, and the way they dealt with it is that time is relative to God. Second Peter 3, uh, you know, that's how Peter is dealing with the scoffing attitude that where is his coming? Things continue on as they always have from the beginning. But I tell you the truth, the present heavens and earth are reserved for the day of judgment, the destruction of the ungodly. But don't overlook this one fact that with the Lord a day is a thousand years, thousand years a day. He's not slow in keeping his promise. Some account slowness, but patient, wanting all to come repentance. So the the point is, is that Peter's. Uh, the way he dealt with the delay that Jesus and they expected the return of Jesus in their lifetime, but it had been some decades at that point. The way you deal with it is the time is relative to God and the oracle is still true. So Isaiah proclaimed it a few hundred years, you know, Zephaniah proclaims it after the exile, Malachi declares it. And it's not that they were wrong that the day of God is at hand. It's not that John and Jesus were wrong. They're just functioning in their prophetic role. And to the oracle, it is true. Time is relative to God. And to God, the day of God is at hand. The judgment is at hand. Uh, and so it's it's fairly simple and it holds water. It, it doesn't need any more explaining than that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. I think this is a real easy one to tackle, understanding at hand, this at hand language related to the kingdom. Not hard to understand again when you link it with the words of the prophets saying the day of the Lord is at hand. Um, and Jesus and John are just reiterating the things that the prophets have said over and over and over again. The day of the Lord, the kingdom of God, the resurrection of the dead, Jewish apocalyptic themes, they are um, temporally at hand. So let's move on to our next kind of problem set of passages. And this would be Matthew 12 and Luke 11. This is uh, the example or the passage where Jesus um, is casting out demons and the Pharisees cast out demons and the Pharisees get mad and Jesus rebukes them. And guys, I don't know. I, I think this one, I mean, I might have you on this one, right? I just read this verse and I think I gotcha. It's Matthew 12, 28. But if it is by the spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God is come upon you. Hmm. I don't know. It sounds like Jesus in, is in introducing Jewish eschatology, right? I mean, obviously, if it's come upon you, it's present tense, right? Mm, maybe not. Ah, <laughs> uh, darn you, Hawkins. <laughs> the Achilles heel wow. in our argument. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, you know, I think I think we'll address the rest of the episode. That We're was gonna... so cheesy, but hey, <laughs> come upon you, yes. <laughs> Let's tackle this one, guys. <laughs> 
So the um, so I think I think the the rest of the episode we're going to spend primarily on Matthew twelve and Luke seventeen, which I have a have a fascinating tradition in the academic world of you know of gospel studies. Um, it, in fact, Johannes Weiss said certainly the two principal passages Matthew twelve twenty eight and Luke seventeen twenty one are spoken in rejoinder to opponents who dismiss its presence. And so clearly these things are, the, the next two we're going to read, which is like Josh just hit on, the come upon you, the kingdom of God has come upon you. And then Luke 17, we'll read a little bit below where the kingdom of God is in your midst or is, is, is within you. Um, these kind of, the, the weight of, of, realized eschatology as a hermeneutic really falls on these two passages in the New Testament. Yeah, and it's really strange to me that you you have this one verse that is taken so out of context in the passage. It's like a it's like the ultimate proof text. It's a single verse that's taken out of the passage as a whole, which is eschatological throughout. And it's used as absolute proof uh, that, you know, Jesus is realizing the Jewish eschatology of his day. And there's a guy, Clayton Sullivan, he wrote a a book called Rethinking Realized Eschatology, which I I don't endorse the whole thing. But I I wanted to read a a, a little bit out of there that kind of highlights this. He says uh, on page 81, he says, an obscure verse should not determine the meaning of unambiguous verses. Matthew 28, 12, 28, and Luke eleven twenty 20, parallel verses, is an obscure, puzzling statement. Jesus' rejoinder to, the ho- to hostile critics who were accusing him of working in league with Beelzebul. Should problematic Matthew 12, 28 be the hermeneutical cornerstone for interpreting the kingdom? This question becomes acute when one notes that there are more than 100 statements concerning the kingdom of God in the synoptics. The majority of these statements present the kingdom as a place, not an exorcistic power. The majority of these statements present the kingdom as a future hope, not a present reality. When this wider interpretive task is undertaken, when all the evidence is considered, hermeneutical weight would have to be assigned to the scores of synoptic statements portraying the kingdom as a future realm rather than to Matthew 12, 28, which according to Dodd portrays the kingdom as a curative power, realized eschatologists reversed the procedure. They assign hermeneutical weight to problematic Matthew 12, 28 and ignore the scores of statements portraying the kingdom as a future realm. And I think this is a, this is a great point that you have such a singular verse that is taken totally in contradiction to the rest of the passage, in contradiction to common apocalyptic thought, and turn it on its head and use it as a proof text to say Jesus is radically redefining everything. Such a strange dynamic to it. Yeah, yeah, really strange dynamic because in many ways it's also taken because, it, you know, you get the kingdom from the, the scriptures going, oh yeah, like when the kingdom comes, it's going to be peace and awesomeness and prosperity. And so it, it's typically also understood w- through that realized eschatological lens as a very positive thing. So when the kingdom comes upon you, Jesus is casting out demons and there you go. Like it, it's, it's good. But if you look at the specifically, I'm, I'm thinking of like Deuteronomy 28 and the curses given, uh, in the covenant to Israel. And you get this idea that, you know, the curses, all these curses, it says, Mo, or Moses says will come upon you if you don't obey the covenant. And, uh, you know, even using the language, the curses will come upon you shows that there's not necessarily a positive aspect, um, to just the phrase coming upon you. Right. So I think, uh, this can, this can really come into play when you understand, um, what's going on with, uh, uh, with this, or, or at least begin to understand what's going on with this passage in the gospels with Jesus. Yeah. So that's a, that's a good point point, Josh, and because the tradition of, of, so Deuteronomy, especially 28 through 32, essentially establishes 
in the Tanakh establishes the Jewish culture and, and ultimately the Jewish way of talking about the future, interestingly. But um, so the, the prophetic literature in particular, you, you know, they, they, they piggyback on uh, Deuteronomy 28 and utilize the come upon language really, really often. And we've heard it often. We just, again, because of the weight given to these other passages that aren't necessarily as straightforward, um, we, don't, we don't read it and, and automatically say, think the same thing like a first century Jew would have. Like Zephaniah 2, gather together, yes, together, O shameless nation, before a decree takes effect, before the day passes away like chaff, before there comes upon you the burning anger of the Lord, before there comes upon you the day of the anger of the Lord. So those, the negative things, they come upon you. It's uh, just the way that they spoke. And this is brought over into the New Testament also, not only in the direct references to the kingdom, but like Ephesians 5, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience, or 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 3, sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, which is reiterating the prophets also. So th- this, the language is as a long tradition of being highly negative from the prophets onward, or really from Deuteronomy, but really in- emphasized in the prophets. Yeah. Yeah, well, and I think even if we just look at the passage and what's going on in the passage, um, it can really give a little bit more context to why when Jesus would say the kingdom of God has come upon you, it's a more of a negative thing as opposed to a positive thing. Because Jesus just right. wrote, he just drove out a demon and everyone thinks he's the Messiah. And then the Pharisees go, Oh, he cast out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. And Jesus is going, guys, watch out what you're saying. Like, this is a big deal. I mean, the the whole context of the passage is eschatological, right? You get the son of David in verse 23. You get the kingdom of God in verse 28. You get the age to come in verse 32, and then the day of judgment in verse 36, all referring to the same Jewish apocalyptic reality. And Jesus is basically saying to the Pharisees, hey, be careful what you say, because your judgment on the last day is going to be determined by your words in this age, right? And so Jesus is saying a negative thing to the Pharisees here, the ones who accused him of casting out a demon by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. Yeah, and just to throw in a little clarifier, I think, you know, the, the whole passage is about the words that the Pharisees spoke. That That's the issue at hand, is that Jesus performed a miracle and people see the miracle and he's anointed by God and therefore this must be the Messiah. Could he be the son of David? And the Pharisees said, no, he drove out that demon uh, by a demon, by Satan. And so it's that accusation that Jesus is talking about in the passage as a whole. And he concludes the passage with, you brood of vipers. And after saying that they had they had committed the unpardonable sin, blaspheme against the Holy Spirit by those words, uh, in verse 20, 31, verse 34, he says, you brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you're evil for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And then he concludes verse 36. I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak, which is he's talking about what the Pharisees just said for by your words, you will be justified by your words. You'll be condemned on the day of judgment. So the whole context of the passage is what's going to happen when the kingdom comes on the last day, on the day of judgment in relation to these words that the Pharisees had spoken. So it makes much more sense that the whole passage is negative, talking about the coming condemnation and judgment and destruction of the Pharisees for the words that they just spoke. And so in this light, the declaration that if I did drive that demon out by the finger of God instead of Satan, then the kingdom of God has come upon you, speaking, you know, in the past as though it's already happened to communicate the surety, the reality of the thing. That's good. And, and, you know, as you guys are talking, brings up another important point. And this is actually an important linguistic point, just in, 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 uh, in looking at uh, m- even more of the problem passages in the New Testament, but also, but also even going back to the Old Testament as well. That's the issue of uh, the language has come upon you. So the interesting use of the past tense 
when everybody knows what he's talking about isn't past tense. And so, um, you know, scholars have, have called this sometimes the uh, proleptic or orist in the New Testament. So it's a proleptic or perfective aspect of talking, the uh, past perfect in the, uh, in the Hebrew uh, is generally where the idea is kind of this way of talking comes from. Um, but so like we're familiar with some of them because some of them get translated. Going back to the Old Testament, some of these ideas get translated as past tense, but all of us recognize that it's talking about something in the future. But we've become so accustomed to certain passages that we don't think about it, right? Like in Genesis 15, in the covenant, where he cuts the covenant with Abraham, and he walks between the animals, and he said, and on that day, so I'm going here to uh, Genesis 15, verse 18, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, to your descendants, I have given this land. So he talks about it in the past as though he's already done it, and... But clearly it hasn't happened, but nobody thinks about it. Or in Isaiah 53 and other, I'm just bringing up some common ones, because this is literally, the, the Old Testament is littered with past tense language that is meant to communicate not just the future, but it's, it's used in the past tense to communicate certainty about the future. So Isaiah 53, 5 is one. Again, really common because it's translated straightforward and we don't think about it. But he was wounded, Isaiah 53, 5, for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him, the punishment that made us whole. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. All of it, by his, by his stripes we are healed. All of it is in the past tense, but it's meant to communicate some certainty about the future. And so this way of talking also becomes native to speakers in the New Testament who are speaking specifically about these eschatological events. Like uh, another one is Jude, right? Jude is, he's just citing Enoch here, but for Jude, it makes sense to cite Enoch in the past tense. It was also about these men that Enoch in the seventh generation, I'm in verse 14, by the way, he prophesied saying, behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all. So it uses the past tense, just like Enoch, to communicate the future. And the last little example here is um, uh, Revelation 14, verse 8. Another angel, a second one, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who has made all the nations drink. And so it's past tense used to communicate the future. And so this actually plays into a lot of these conversations, particularly in the Gospels, is there's a lot of times the future is spoken of with such certainty that just like the prophets and even in the Torah, it's spoken of sometimes in the past tense because that's kind of how Jews used to talk sometimes. Yeah, and if some people are familiar with uh, the trend in modern uh Greek linguistic studies uh, concerning Greek verbal aspect theory that argues that the Greek verbs actually don't carry tense at all. They're much more uh, like the Hebrew verbal system that is uh, oriented around aspect of the verb instead of tense. So the verb doesn't actually carry time. And this is actually, in, in Greek linguistics, this has become almost universally accepted in the last 10, 15 years. And uh, it really started uh, with Stanley Porter and Boyce Fanning, and uh, Don Carson actually made his way in, in the academy back in the 90s on uh, Greek verbal aspect and is carried on today uh, by folks like uh, Constantine Campbell and David Croto, and that uh, linguists that are uh, very comp competent in Greek. And the argument is that all of the exceptions that had to be made when Greek was kind of revived during the Renaissance and then was kind of worked through during the Enlightenment, right. the whole Greek system was created, the Greek verb system was created around tense instead of aspect, past, present, and future. But you have so many passages 
like Romans uh, eight, for example, thirty is right. a very well known one. A very well known one where Paul says, "Those who he predestined, he also called; those who he called, he also justified; those who he justified, he also glorified." All of which are, uh, you know, historically termed errorist and in the past tense. But obviously, we haven't been glorified. Right before that, uh, Paul makes it very clear what being glorified is in the resurrection and the glory to come. And so you create all of these exceptions, 20 to 30% of the time, Greek verbs have exceptions. Supposedly you have a past, uh, a futuristic aorist or a historical present or things like this. And so they argued that no, uh, the Greek verb is actually aspectual. It communicates the aspect of the, of, uh, the action that's happening, not the time of it. And so then it's uh, perfective, imperfective, or stative. Uh, and I'll let, you know, if you guys are, if anybody listening is interested, then check out Stanley Porter and uh, Constantine Campbell have great books on that. And if that is true, then it wouldn't even be that Jesus is speaking in the past tense to communicate the certainty. It's that the Greek verb itself isn't past tense. The Greek verb is perfective, which is often used in relation to things in the past because they're complete. They've happened. There's, but perfective can simply communicate the certainty of something. And if that is the case, then you would translate verse 28 as if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God will certainly come upon you. So you could do it either way. Right. The, yeah. But either way you take that statement, whether he's speaking past tense to communicate the certainty of it, or if past tense isn't actually assumed in the verb, either way the message is the same. That if if I actually drove that demon out by the finger of God rather than a demon, your judgment is certain on the day of judgment. And I think that's the that makes the whole passage fit together and communicate the same thing. It's a highly negative passage. Right. The What's not happening here is Jesus huddling the Pharisees together and go, gather round, fellas. Come on. I, I have a principle to share with you about the kingdom. That's definitely not happening here. <laughs> Nobody is thinking that. And, uh, you know, verse, verse 29, sometimes even people kind of import the idea because in verse 29, he references, you know, going into the strong man's house and binding him. and But even there, all, like all of Jewish tradition from Jubilees and Enoch and a lot of really prominent Jewish texts familiar to his audience at the time, the binding or the plundering of Satan was entirely an eschatological event, just like it is in Revelation. And so... The, the fact that he's even referencing that just grounds the passage even more in context to the end of the age. Yeah. 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 Sure. That's good. Well, guys, let's move on to our next uh, problem passage, which would be Luke 17, verses 20 and 21. And well, really just the the whole passage from Luke 17, 20 towards the end. Um, Jesus would say, being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Now, some other translations translate in the midst of you as the kingdom of God is in you or within you. Um, and so, of course, this is interpreted uh, through a realized eschatological lens, uh, understanding the kingdom of God as some present tense reality. And this is one of the big ones, one of the pillars of realized eschatology. Uh, but what's going on here? Yeah, and this passage has a long theological tradition, uh, even going back to the Nag Hammadi Library and the Gospel of Thomas, uh, that this saying gets quoted arguing that the kingdom is actually a spiritualized reality within you. And it was, it was, one of Origen's favorite passages, he quoted often, and Anthony, if you read the life of Anthony that Athanasius wrote, uh, Anthony uses the same passage to argue for a spiritualistic interpretation that is something within you. So the King James and some of the newer English versions that translate it within you, uh, are doing, are mainly translating it 
based on tradition uh, rather than the text itself. Because obviously it's spoken, you know, in response to uh, Pharisees that are seemingly somewhat hostile. And so the kingdom of God isn't within them, you, plural. So uh, it has, so then it gets tweaked to in the midst of you. Right. Gather round, fellas. Lesson number two. <laughs> no. Same, same context, super intense. Uh, so, so the backdrop for this is a culture that had been created, really going all the way back to the Maccabean Revolt. And I say culture, but what, what I'm talking about is, so like people might be familiar with the, uh, with the zealots. And um, the zealots were, were a Pharisee breakoff movement. Um, around in the first century, who named themselves based on a passage in First Maccabees, when um, when Mattathias Maccabees called uh, to all those loyal or all those zealous for the law and for God to join him out in the desert, and they formed a revolt movement out there. And so Jesus is simply referencing this thing that everybody knows. Is it, it just this is what happens in the culture is these revolutionary leaders are raised up and they take people out into the desert where there's no Roman presence and they go and try to form an insurgency and they come and try to take the take the kingdom of David by by force. So he's just referencing that idea. Um and, and that's gonna kind of play out in the rest of his conversation in Luke seventeen. Yeah, yeah, and I think Matthew 24, you know, Jesus will repeat this same sort of point. Um, Matthew 24, 26, you know, Jesus says, oh, well, if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, don't go out. Or if they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, don't believe it. Jesus is encouraging his disciples by saying, no, um, the Son of Man is, and the kingdom is not going to be established through a Jewish zealot movement like the Maccabean Revolt. Don't let someone say, oh, yeah, look, look at all those people gathering out there. It's kind of like happening again, maybe, or look at the secret plotting in the inner rooms. I mean, man, clearly those guys are plotting how to assassinate the Roman, the, the Roman emperor. And, you know, finally God's going to anoint them and reestablish the kingdom for Israel and the Messiah is going to come and it's going to be good. Jesus is saying, no, guys, this is not the way that the kingdom is established because in many ways the zealots, or I suppose you could say the Pharisees were sympathetic um, slightly to the cause of the zealots uh, in the first century because it would keep them at the top of the food chain. Right. And they would say, sweet, right. we can be in power. Uh, and uh, man, if if you guys want to start this whole insurrection thing, then we'll get behind it and uh, we can we can still be at the top of the food chain. And Jesus is correcting the Pharisees here in this passage yeah. by saying, no, the kingdom of God does not come by the strength of the flesh. The kingdom is not going to be like the Maccabean revolt. Um, and, and this is, well, as he goes on to say, you know, in the next part of the passage, the kingdom doesn't come like that. Yeah, it's strange in like commentaries. When you read commentaries on Luke 17, they almost all, the basic argument is that Jesus is correcting the apocalyptic expectations of the Pharisees <laughs> right. by spiritualizing. <laughs> and it totally flips the whole argument on its head exactly. when in reality, Jesus is correcting the non-apocalyptic expectations of the Pharisees yes. and saying, you guys are not apocalyptic enough. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't come in the synergistic manner by the strength of man. It's, we don't help usher it in. Excellent point. Um, and, and Josh, in, in reference, so what's happening, like, like you were talking about, in reference to the signs, this is another part of that culture I mentioned previously of the Maccabean revolt and this this culture of insurgency uh, because like uh, Acts 5 has a good little historical uh, footnote in it where where um, Gamaliel is rising up in defense of 
a couple of the apostles and in Acts 5. Uh, so down in verse 36, he references how Thutis rose up, claiming to be somebody in a group of 400 people. And then he says, and after that man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the census and drew some away after himself. And Judas was actually, according to Jewish Encyclopedia and other Jewish sources, Judas of Galilee was the co-founder of the Zealot movement. And so he's referenced there, but an interesting note is that Josephus in Antiquities 20 mentions Thutis as a guy who gathered a group out in the wilderness. So like, like uh, we're saying here, when they say, look, here he's, uh, look, he's out in the wilderness, he's in the rooms, don't believe it. So that Thutis would go out there, or Thutis went out according to Josephus, and he told all of his followers he was going to go gather just beyond the Jordan, and he was going to give them a sign that he was the one that God had ordained to take the kingdom by force by parting the Jordan River and kind of portraying himself as a second Moses. And so this culture, even the culture of asking for signs and granting signs as evidence that God had anointed you to establish the kingdom is a really, really common, th- or at least a very well-known dynamic in the culture that Jesus is talking all around in the passage. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And again, if if the point is that Jesus is correcting the expectations of the Pharisees for oh this is gonna the kingdom is gonna be established by the strength of the flesh through through zealotry in some way through some sort of insurrection or insurgency I mean I think if if we see this passage the opposite way which is I think uh, we all think the way that it should be seen. Um, It's clear because this is what Jesus does in the very next section. So, you know, he says the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. It's not going to come like through an insurrection. And then he turns to his disciples after saying that to the Pharisees, he turns to his disciples in verse 22 through 37. And he says, so the kingdom is going to come suddenly from heaven, like lightning flashes from the east to the west. And he compares it to the days of Noah and the days of Lot, like where flood uh, the flood came, and when judgment, the judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah came, it's going to come suddenly, apocalyptically, it's going to be obvious, it's not going to be hidden, no one's going to be in the inner rooms and go, ooh, like there's there's plotting going on there. No, it's, it's, it's going to be visible, it's going to be seen, and it's going to be epic and apocalyptic. And so the point is that Jesus is correcting the Pharisees' expectation and saying, no, it actually is apocalyptic. It really is going to come suddenly from heaven, not progressively from man on the day of the Lord. Yeah, and I think if we take it that way, then you would translate the time or the tense in English as a futuristic reality. Um, John Nolan has a great commentary, the word biblical commentary, where uh, he kind of hashes out uh, interpreting this as a futuristic present in which you would, you would translate it as uh, behold, the kingdom of God will be in your midst or into your midst. Um, and I think Jesus takes it a step further. And uh, when they ask when the kingdom of God would come, Erkamai, he says the kingdom of God is not coming, Erkamai, like the common word, with signs to be observed, saying here it is, there it is, for the kingdom of God is a me, in or into the midst of you, your midst. And so why the change in verb? And most commentaries will say that change of verb is the hinge. That's the hinge of realized eschatology. And I would say, no, that change of verb is simply to communicate that it's God and not humans. That I am who I am. So in the Septuagint, you know, Exodus 3, that's a me. And so he's communicating that it is God, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. And moreover, that verb a me can communicate movement. And so like in Matthew 21, uh, they, they ask, uh, Jesus when he, uh, cleanses the the if he why he, how he has authority over the temple sorry and he asked the question the baptism of John from where is it 
or where was it? And all the translations translate from where did it come? Because it's the point of origin. Yep. Yep. Or like John 7, when they ask, um, you know, when the Christ comes, no one will know where he is from. And all the translations say where he comes from. Because if you use a me in relation to a point of origin, then you you translate it with comes to communicate the the movement of it. So I think Luke 17 is the same way in which that's the point of the passage is where does the kingdom of God come from? And that's what Jesus is correcting. He's saying the kingdom of God comes from heaven, not from man. And so I think that verse uh, would do well to be translated that uh, you won't say, look, here it is, or there it is, for behold, the kingdom of God will come into your midst uh, from heaven, from God, like lightning from the east to the west, like the days of Lot and Noah. And that then the whole thing flows, and he's saying one thing instead of saying two yeah. radically different things yeah. in the passage yeah. as a whole. Exactly. Well, it's good, guys. We've hit at hand, we've hit come upon you, and now we've hit... Um, within you or in your midst. So there's a few other passages we maybe could discuss here. And so let's do, uh, I know we've only done this for a Q and episode before, but let's do a little rapid fire round. Let's talk about uh, some quick, just quick discussion of, of some passages in the gospel specifically that have to do with the kingdom. These are common passages, maybe passages you've heard before, passages you've used yourself that, again, affirm a Jewish ap apocalyptic perspective, not something that is radically different or whatever. So let's start with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, thy kingdom come. What's this all about? Yeah, these are a lot of these passages, the main three are always quoted, you know, usually in tandem as proof texts that the Jewish eschatology is happening now, spiritually universalized. And so all the other ones are, you can slant them either way. So the Lord's Prayer is a great example. Your kingdom come, your will be done. That could be talking about now, or that could be talking about the Jewish messianic kingdom at the day of God with the resurrection. And it can go either way, however you read it. The question is, does the surrounding passage evidence that, for example, in the Sermon on the Mount? And I would say the surrounding language makes more sense if it, if it is according to the traditional Jewish apocalyptic view. And because he concludes with, therefore, uh, if you don't forgive, then you won't be forgiven at the judgment. And not only is the surrounding passage seem more likely to me to be eschatological, but the early church interpreted the Lord's Prayer as eschatological. So if you read the Didache, the teaching of the Twelve, which is the basically one of the earliest uh, manuscripts we have besides the New Testament writings, late first century, it's kind of a church manual, and they quote uh, in... Uh, in chapter 7, they quote the Lord's Prayer. The chapters are real short. They quote in chapter 7 the Lord's Prayer and then conclude after that, may grace come and may this world pass away. Hosanna to the God of David. If anyone is holy, let him come. If, if anyone is not, let him repent. Maranatha. And so their conclusion to the Lord's Prayer is that the prayer for the kingdom to come is the prayer for the return of Jesus, is Maranatha. And I think that fits much better uh, and, and makes more sense of the passage that Jesus is, is simply teaching them to pray for the day of God, for the hope of the resurrection, to set your hope fully on that and not be distracted uh, and have your eyes set on things of this age. Yeah, it's good. Um, what about um, what about Matthew eleven and the kingdom suffers violence? Yeah, yeah, that's a good one, Bill. I, I think. Uh, well, Jesus says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. And you know, the whole passage here is a negative passage uh, in many ways. And I mean, th this is just, this is a, a weird one. It's a really weird one that many will take in one direction or another. I've heard it 
talked about in so many different ways. But this is just drawing on Jewish apocalyptic themes. Again, before the day of the Lord, we know that from the scriptures, from the prophets, from the Torah, the righteous are going to suffer and they're going to be persecuted. And this is common Jewish apocalyptic expectation. Um, and so at this point, John's in prison. The messianic um, woes. Yeah, yeah, all the messianic woes. Exactly. So John is in prison at this point, right? He's been suffering and, and is being persecuted. Jesus had already talked about persecution coming in the passage just before this one. And so both Jesus and John are suffering persecution at the hands of violent men because of the message that they're proclaiming, which is repent for the day of the Lord or the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so this one is simple when you just understand the, the common apocalyptic expectation of the messianic woes, of a suffering before glory. This is just the righteous are going to suffer, and this is what's happening. They're they're suffering. the The message that they're preaching is is causing them to have people stare at them and and talk them down and go, "What are you saying? No, you're wrong." And so they're suffering persecution as the law and the prophets uh, indicated that would happen to the righteous. Yeah. So what about another one like Matthew six thirty three? Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added. Okay, I'm going to try to keep it rapid in the fire. So <laughs> go, going back just to, uh, like, back to uh, where he's talking about have your treasure in heaven and not on the earth where moth destroys. So the point is, is that after that, he's just going to talk about provision and the things of this world versus keeping your focus on the age to come. And then the conclusion is just so... Seek first the kingdom of God or the things that are to come, and God will provide for you. Like just like just like the end of chapter five, where he says, Your father causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. Like, stop freaking out. So it's just kind of the same conclusion. Like, seek, you preoccupy yourself on what's to come and seeking first righteousness in light of the things that are coming. And stop worrying about the stuff that God will freely give you because he cares for you. Yeah. Right. And and Luke 12, I love the the kind of parallel passage in Luke 12 where he says, For all the Gentiles seek after these things. Verse 30, Your father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide for yourselves money bags that do not grow old with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches, no moth destroys. For where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. And so it's even further like it just makes a whole lot more sense that seek first the kingdom is seek first the treasure to be rewarded on the day of judgment and eternal life. And it, and it actually kind of plays into a number of, uh, of passages out of the Jewish apocalyptic literature that describe the treasuries of heaven, that there's an accounting that happens that's actually written in the books being recorded, that on the day of judgment, people will be rewarded for their good deeds and punished for their wicked deeds, and it's actually tallied. And you'll get a reward that's calculated. And so Jesus is simply saying, seek first the age to come and that treasure rather than this age and this treasure. Sell your stuff in this age. It's a much better investment. Sell your possessions, give to the needy, store up treasure in the heavens that then on the day of judgment will be awarded to you, multiplied many times over. And everything in this age is going to be destroyed anyway. And it's eaten up and it falls apart and so it makes a whole lot more sense, I think, that if uh, you interpret it in context to the yeah. age to come. Yeah. yeah. How about another one, guys? Matthew 21, uh, this is the parable of the two sons, chapter 21, verses 28 uh, through 30, 31, 32. What do you think? A man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I'm not going to work. And then afterward, he changed his mind. And then he went. And then he went to another son and said the same. And he answered, I'll go. But then he didn't go. And which of the two did the will of his father? And they said, the first. And Jesus said, truly, I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. What's this one about? Yeah, this is a uh this one can just be taken either one, either way. I think, you know, you, I've, 
I've heard it kind of preach that a present realization type of deal. But most, if you read any commentaries uh, on Matthew, they'll all acknowledge that Jesus probably has a future reality in mind here. And even like the NASB, I think, translates it as uh, the tax collectors and prostitutes will go into the kingdom of God ahead of you. And so this can just be taken either way. It's however, again, however you start with the text, you end up reading that into it. And so I think in the the context, you know, right before that, Jesus tells a parable about uh, the vineyard workers and how the first will be last and the last will be first. And so the, he's simply saying that the tax collectors and the prostitutes are last in this age and will go into the kingdom of God in the age to come and they will be first. And so when he says they, they will go into the kingdom of God ahead of you, it's actual, actually a radical con, uh, condemnation saying you religious leaders think you're first, but you're actually going to be last. Yeah. And so it, it flows in the, in this along the same lines. Yeah. Yeah. How about one more? How about classic one from John 3? I mean, Bill, a few weeks ago on our podcast, we put out uh, one of your teachings on John 3 and why such an apocalyptic gospel. So, you know, when Jesus says, if someone isn't born again, he can't see the kingdom. Um, what's this one all about? Um, yeah. And then he's, uh, then he, you know, then he says back, you know, does the parallel saying and says you can't enter into the kingdom. And <laughs> the difference between the two is really hard to figure out when you're when you're kind of viewing it in a realized sense. But so the point of the passage is that it's it's he's not talking about uh, it's not a conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus about Nicodemus having Jesus in his heart. It's about Nicodemus coming as a representative of the Pharisees. Like kind of like in Luke 17, we're talking about wondering if he might be the guy because of the signs that they saw that God is anointed to bring the redemption. And so, so he comes and he says, you know, no, we, we all recognize that God sent you because of the signs. And then what, what's happening is he's offering him kind of like a deal to kind of join forces with the Pharisees and establish the kingdom. And so Jesus is basically, again, just reiterating it comes apocalyptically. And it's going to happen in context to, like the prophet said, the the nation is going to be born again. And so that's why all of the verbs throughout there are either plural or they later on get explained as plural when when kind of the imagery goes away and Jesus just explains it plainly. So the, the point is that he's talking about the nation and not about the individual. And he's just saying, unless the nation is born again, it's not going to see the kingdom of God and the redemption. It's actually going to be an eschatological deliverance. The born, the born language is like in the prophets, like Ezekiel used to talk about uh, um, the exodus as, as being born. And so it's in, and so the, the whole passage is referencing Ezekiel 36. And so the context is most likely that he's talking about the nation being delivered again by God eschatologically. And that's the, the only point where they're actually going to enter into the kingdom of God. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the huge connections between Ezekiel 36 and 37, as you mentioned uh, a few weeks ago, um, with water and the spirit. And, uh, how those exact, that exact language is used by the prophets, specifically in Ezekiel 36 and 37. Yeah. And first, first, it, then it lines up also with 1 Corinthians 15, where yeah. Paul says flesh and blood yes. cannot inherit the kingdom mm-hmm. of God. Of course, those are different contexts. One is a Gentile kind of Gnostic context. The other is a very kind of Jewish zealot oriented context, but, the point of both sayings is that they're said in response to non-apocalyptic eschatology. Yep, yep. Jesus correcting the Jewish non-apocalyptic bent, and then uh, Paul correcting the Gentile non-apocalyptic yep, bent. Yep, and point. so the two then line up and, and uh, make sense. That's it. That way. That's it. Well... This has been great, guys. In our next episode, we really want to spend some time looking at the parables. And I think the parables are so much in terms of uh, uh, the way that realized eschatology can can 
find its fruition uh, in the hearts and minds of a modern evangelical uh, parables. They can they can be really powerful in terms of how someone interprets the gospels, rather than basing our interpretation on the law and the prophets. Uh, oftentimes, understanding of the kingdom is based on first and foremost the parables. Um, and so we want to tackle the parables in the next episode and uh, really, again, just as we've done today, fit the parables within a Jewish apocalyptic context. And then in our future episode, uh, several future episodes, we, we want to continue to develop these themes of the kingdom. But following our parables episode, we want to tackle Paul and the references in Paul's letters related to the kingdom of God uh, and develop those a bit. But as we wrap up today, guys, so what? How do we respond, understanding all these things, looking at uh, first century Jewish apocalyptic thought related to the kingdom? What's our response? Yeah, for me, the response is repent. You know, it, it's the, the response should be a uh, sober, uh, the kingdom passages, all three of the main kingdom passages are fairly, really, all of them that we looked at, even the rapid fire, are very, they have a sober, semi-negative feel, and people came out trembling, the axes through the tree, who warned you to flee the wrath to come, repenting in fear. And so, yeah. for me, these passages all represent a affirmation of the Jewish apocalyptic expectations, and even in some cases, an indictment of non-apocalyptic eschatology. And so when these passages get used to argue for an, a non-apocalyptic eschatology, for me, it's just like, oh, it, it's, it's heartbreaking <laughs> yeah. when these passages should really bring us yeah to a point of sobriety, to fear of the Lord, to repentance, and to a hope that uh, is eternal and can't be shaken. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Well, and like we've talked about before, really these passages are not redefining something, but the issue is not what the kingdom is. The issue is how the disciples and, and the crowds and those uh, should respond. And so I think... As you're saying, John, I mean, this is what I walk away with too. I think of Jesus's words in Luke 21 in terms of how one ought to respond in light of the, the proclamation of the day of the Lord and the coming kingdom. Um, Jesus says, but watch yourselves, lest your, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life. And that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all who dwell in the face of the whole earth, but stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Right. And, you know, for me, the, the sobriety related to these uh, these passages that we've looked at and, and all of the passages related to the day of the Lord and the kingdom um, should stir this response of repent, <laughs> turn to the God of Israel, walk in, in sobriety, be careful how you live, let your heart not be weighed down by the cares of this life, because the day is going to come suddenly like a trap. It, it will ensnare you as like the flood did for those at the days of Noah. They weren't looking and, and the flood came and swept them all away. They, they weren't eagerly waiting and uh, they weren't living with the sense of sobriety. And so for me, my takeaway is may we live in sobriety. May we pray that we would have strength to escape the snare of dissipation and drunkenness and the cares of this life and to actually stand before the Son of Man blameless on the last day when he establishes the kingdom from heaven. Amen. Amen. That's good. <clears throat> um, I think what, what stands out to me um, going through these passages again is like, it's really kind of the point of uh, of the last couple passages we brought up, and even so, several of the rapid fire. Is that the point? Is is that Jesus is is correcting these non apocalyptic views of eschatology, not for doctrinal purposes, but actually for practical purposes, because people are actually listening to these insurrectionist leaders promising them that they are going to establish the redemption, that, that God has anointed them, and if they get enough support, 
then they will bring the kingdom of God. Wait, are you talking about Je- are you talking about <laughs> Jews or Gentiles? <laughs> well, who are you talking about? Right. Right. So you see where I could be going with this. <clears throat> So my my so what is that this is this is uh like this is a, a present concern that that people need to deal with yeah. that this is the point is that whether to first century Jew or now the reason why these passages like the irony of them being used like John said to say the exact opposite right. of what they're saying right. It's so it's not just ironic it's so dangerous yeah. because the point is is Jesus is condemning these movements to try to bring the redemption either on their own or with Jesus or with God he's saying neither one of them work like Isaiah 63 no one brings redemption i do it by myself yeah and and so my my point is is what if you have followed any of these movements, um, then then the, the quick on-ramp to repentance is simply to, because you don't just turn away from something, you turn to something else. That's, that's how you repent. And what you yeah. turn to is you give yourself to seeking first the kingdom of God, and like 1 Thessalonians 1, you repent from worshiping idols, and you turn to God and wait for His Son from heaven who will establish the redemption on the day of his coming. So my, my takeaway is, my goodness, the noise right now in the evangelical world is crazy. And it's just like, just, just don't worry about it and just give yourself to what's urgent, right? The, the end, like Josh quoted, the end of all things is near. So be sober-minded and so that you can pray, and and pray that you might have, like Josh just said above, pray that you might have strength to escape these things that are about to come upon the earth. So my takeaway is just, just you know, break free from the confusion. God alone brings redemption and establishes the kingdom. You give yourself to what's needed, and it will clear itself up. Amen. Amen. That's Amen. it. Yeah. Yeah. Great exhortation, Bill. Well, may we live with sobriety and eagerness and anticipation of the God of Israel being faithful to his covenant and setting a son of David on a throne in Jerusalem, the kingdom that will never be destroyed and never be shaken. This is our hope and our confidence, and may we live as ones who eagerly seek and expect that today uh, and boldly proclaim it um, with certainty. So, amen, guys. Great to be with you today. Listeners, thanks for joining us. We hope you've been encouraged and strengthened, and we look forward to developing the parables next time. So join us next time on the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. God bless and Maranatha. Maranatha. Thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. For more, visit us on our website at apocalypticgospel.com and follow us on Twitter at Apocalyptic Gospel. 